We make stuff here. We create stuff here. That lends itself to the artist community. Not just the fine arts, but also the industrial arts. We can balance it with the components of all of this old industry. Each one of those art pieces that we're installing downtown reflects that industrial heritage. These are pieces that tell stories about York's history. I have objects in front of me, I have to turn them into something. I enjoy that. But I also think it's necessary. I make art to entertain myself and uh, other people. That is a hard question to answer. I'm really driven. It's like dream art. I should probably have put some thought to this first. <laughs> if I can't sleep, I'll think about art and then I can sleep. Uh, it's uh, a passion. Because I think it pushes technology and the boundaries and I think it pushes the way people see the world. Uh, everyone may get something different from it. And I think it improves the way I understand the world. They may not necessarily get what I was thinking, but they get their own thoughts from it, which is great. I am compelled to make art. That's the truth. The process, for sure. It's also good therapy. Makes you feel good. So I keep going with the parts and pieces. Pieces that really don't seem to have a connection to one another. Because I can see a bigger picture at the end. Reconstruction, I guess. You know, disassembling something, breaking something apart to create something aesthetically pleasing as well as being functional. But as they come together in the form that evolves as I'm working, they each seem to highlight or magnify something uh, worthwhile. And the others. The machine eventually makes me feel good and I laugh at it <laughs> when I'm done. An imaginary uh, thing that comes to life is around forever after that. Always to be the only one. Uh, and it gives back to others when they get to see it. I just like to see the fulfillment that you get out of that spread to other people. It's an open-air gallery that creates an experience for the people who live here, who come to work here, who come to visit here. Any sense of place gives those residents a sense of pride. This is home.
Whenever I see rivets, I'm not taking somebody else's work apart. That stays together. Catch it in a funnel, pull it out with a pair of tongs, put it through the holes of all the pieces that they're trying to rivet together. And then they'll have two guys with the steam hammers on either side, just, you know, blasting this thing until it rounded ahead on the other side. That's what all these rivets are in this building. I mean, that's a tribute to, you know, American ingenuity and the way things were made. So in the bottom gear, there's some rivets. Inside the Caterpillar main drive, there's rivets and stuff, so. Yeah, I'm never gonna take that apart. I try to expose a lot of the numbers and letters that are on the pieces. So whenever I can, I'll flip it to the outside so that you can see that. And just something about that really makes it authentic. Somebody who has the knowledge and has lived in New York can pick out stuff that you know they're familiar with. I think in our culture, people are so used to something being really lightweight or plastic. This isn't like that. This is solid, heavy. This isn't fragile. This is something that, you know, was made to work. And the welds on it, you know, they're gonna hold up. It's something people can enter into. It's something people can walk around. I know people are gonna be touching this, this piece. Their hands are gonna be all over it. This is gonna hopefully be the smaller stuff that I make. When you stand on a corner in a downtown and you look across the street or you look down the block. It's those things that you see that help define this place, that, that makes it not anywhere else USA. I love to build things. I've always had jobs where I worked really hard and got really dirty. I restored boats and, uh, you know, I did ornamental ironwork and now I'm doing furniture lighting and sculpture. It's all been really, I started out at Bobby's, younger than Bobby, at 18 building fire escapes in the city. Blocks of them. And now as I get older, I'm thinking, what was I thinking? When Bobby's not in college or not in school, he's been helping me over the shop for years now. I just feel like it's a great opportunity and I'm lucky to even get myself out there. I have about 10 birds of uh, all different sizes. I got some big, some small. I was thinking we could put some on like window sills and some on tree branches and just spots that you would actually see birds. So people can look at them and at first glance they might not even realize it's a metal bird if it's far away and they're like, oh wait, that's actually a, a sculpture. I think that just about everybody that's run across this shop or popped into the shop has had a great experience and they love snooping around and looking at everything that's here and they're just like, wow, whatever made you think of that? My pieces have gotten bigger since I've moved into an area where I can stretch a little bit and uh, I can't keep them all. does a lot to uh, bring up your spirit when you create a great piece and you're the only one that could have created that piece. And it's the only one out there and uh, people are enjoying it. It's just been really a lot of fun for us over the years. I'm just so happy to get some public art out there. This was a collaborative effort. It started on North Beaver Street in right there by the arts galleries and all the small retail shops where we had uh, M&T Bank said, we'll give you $10,000 if you can get all of the businesses on this block to match it collectively. And let's do something really impactful. Well, down below my shop here, I have, I guess, probably two acres of, of inventory. And I've uh, palletized everything. People that know what I do, or at least the local farmers, they, they give me parts and pieces. I got to college and, and uh, my first sculpture class was in the metal shop. And 
and that, um, that was it for me. And I've been doing it ever since. I built a senior project. It was a big snake. I think I made 2,300 bucks like a, a week out of college. I graduated college, walked across the stage, loaded the snake up, took it to Kansas, and they bought it. So I had some money right away to buy some tools for making more metal stuff, and that's exactly what I did with it. put the John Deere bulldozer tracks, put them in. They weigh about a ton. I don't remember the model of the machine that it came off of, but a, a friend of mine from Griffith Brothers Landscaping gave me the tracks. The second piece was cartoon gears, which is a small gear and a large gear, and the, the gears themselves are made out of wood and then it's got a sandwich of steel plate on the outside. And then the third piece is the, the rooster, and it's made from Alice Chalmer uh, corn chopper parts. Day to day, I constantly think about making something, you know, unique. If I could, I mean, if I could just do straight sculpture and art and creatures, and I would probably do that all the time. And so we were at the time working with Pat Sells of Salvage and Creativity, who was doing all these really cool, funky things with this industrial art. And so we decided, let's take this 20,000 and do some really interesting street amenities. We'll do benches, we'll do trash cans and planters. And we were able to pull all of those businesses together to match that grant. I went to York College and just took a part-time sculpture course in there and really loved it. Then I met some people that had started their foundry business in a garage, and I think I worked for $3.25 an hour just to get a feel for it and to learn about it, and I ended up staying with them off and on for seven years. wax goes to the foundry, gets dipped in a ceramic shell, and then we burn the wax out. And that makes it a unique piece, it's one of a kind. I probably have done over a thousand castings, I have no idea, I haven't counted. I'll have all the receipts for everything, but uh, it's been a, a you know, maybe 1,200, 1,300 castings. And some were just little pieces. I made um, a piece called The Tinker, and it's a takeoff on the Tin Man from the Wizard of Oz who became real industrial with a lot of bolts and nuts and um, the thinker from Rodan. When pieces go outside, uh, they already become smaller, so I wanted to do it large enough that it'd be, it would be visible. And I, I really uh, love old things and I think uh, the gears tied in with what was already around, the, the other pieces that were in the city, and, and he's kind of there pondering, you know, what happened to the, the Industrial Revolution? <laughs> Where did it go? <laughs>
our downtown has little districts, and so we had North George Street say, well, look at Beaver Street. We want what they have, so um, North George Street businesses got together, found an anonymous donor of $10,000, challenged their businesses on that block to get together. Why not use what's here already? Why do we have to replace, you know, things with new things? Picassiette, a French term. So a lot of what I do is Picassiette. I've probably always had my hand in something creative. It's really important to me that something that's been discarded and no longer viewed as, say, fashionable or desirable or perfect can be taken and restructured somehow and appreciated. An artist has their paints and they can mix and get the shade they want, but I'm really dependent on finding you know, colors and a lot of shades. I don't want to be here in the middle of doing a project and think, oh, I wish I had a little lighter green. I might have to dig a lot through all my supplies till I find it, but I don't want to have to go and start shopping for it. I kind of like the fact that my materials direct what I do. I'm not as in charge of them of the end product as some other um, artists may be with the materials they use. I have to be willing to respond to what that piece of pottery, that dish will let me do with it. I have always loved haunting thrift shops for whatever, <laughs> clothing, furniture, household items of various types. And since I already had that habit and sort of knew where to go, for whatever I might be looking to save money on, I also found that they were a great um, source for dishes. As I was working on the pipes, I started feeling like, oh, well, this references some of the architectural features of York's properties. I ended up putting in some arches, and I thought, yeah, that sort of was a nod to the arch tops of many windows. Especially the vintage of a lot of the architecture in downtown New York, you'll see a lot of those buildings have the arched windows, which I always think is a pleasing line. It's, it's a, uh, a thriving, vibrant downtown with amenities, arts amenities, cultural amenities, um, a thousand to 2,500 new residents uh, from 25 to 45, all living in really cool um, rental apartments and, and homeowner condos all downtown with things going on during the day, things going on at night. Um, public arts splattered all over downtown with no uh, no real system, just a, a comfortable understanding that, that, that the community's galvanized around all of these people.